Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order the NMU uh, Academic Affairs Committee. Present with us today is committee member Subbanen, um, and also uh, Chairperson Savoy, who will be serving as ex officio. Um, we have five agenda topics today, and we are going to start with our Academic Senate update from Dr. Norma Froelich. Please come on up. We have a little bit of a different setup, so feel free to um, sit down. Right sit down. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> that I can do. All right. Good morning. Is picking up or I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. Uh, you do have my written report, and I'm not going to hit every single sentence and word of it, but uh, the general gist. Uh, the Academic Senate makes recommendations to the Provost Vice President for Academic Affairs on academic policy, on changes to curriculum, and on other matters of faculty-wide concern. Uh, we include faculty members from schools and departments across the campus, uh, student government and administration. We also have 11 standing committees who prepare many of the reports and recommendations that then I, I then forward on to the Provost uh, after we debate them over the course of two of our bi-weekly meetings. Um, typically, the early part of the academic year involves mostly preparatory work, as we're kind of ramping up into all of our proposals and recommendations. This year, though, we have already reviewed and recommended several curriculum changes. Those include 27 new courses, two course changes, and three new programs that you'll be hearing about uh, later in this meeting, including a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Acting, a Certificate of Competency in German-Speaking Cultures, and a master's in administration of outdoor recreation and nature-based tourism. Um, we're also starting some discussions about the relationship between global campus program and academic affairs. And that sort of fits in our matters of other faculty-wide concern and our academic policy um, directive. Um, over the last few years, there have been frequent comments and questions at Senate and Senate subcommittee meetings and in informal conversations around campus about the global campus program. Um, there's some lack of clarity and thus there's lack of understanding. There may also be some structural issues that perhaps should be revisited now that global campus has been operating for a few years. The global campus evidently operates on different budgetary and hiring models, though I don't know the details of them uh, exactly. Uh, global campus also uses some staff, faculty and other resources within the academic affairs and umbrella. And there's also questions among faculty about how the academic approvals happen about the curriculum within the global campus program. Uh, many senators are therefore concerned about the possible effects on traditional in-person programs within academic affairs. When resources are diverted to online global campus programs, a worthy idea for an in-person program or an existing in-person program, a new one or an existing one, um, may be ineligible for the benefits and therefore unable to incubate and grow. And while there's certainly need for support for online programs, there's questions as to whether the current structure with global campus separate from academic affairs, whether that inadvertently harms more traditional programs and students who seek a traditional in-person education. So we expect to continue that inquiry. As much as anything, it's a lack of clarity and lack of understanding and trying to figure out what it is before we try to say, should there be some structural changes? All right, finally, if you'll permit me to diverge a little bit from my re report, I'd like to make a comment about what I'm starting to see as chair of the Senate in terms of loss of enthusiasm about committee work on campus. This year, faculty are working hard, and last year as well, uh, faculty are working harder and longer hours than we ever have to meet the needs of our current students. A friend of mine commented to me yesterday that in the last two weeks, almost 25% of our students have been absent at least once because of COVID exposure or COVID-like symptoms. And that means that that's not atypical across the, the university at all. And sometimes it's just one or two days that they're absent and then they're like, okay, that was just allergies, I'm back in. Um, but what that means is that we're all doing far more one-on-one -on -one meetings, far more one-on-one -on -one <laughs> Zoom sessions, far more emails to make sure that every student's caught up. We're also spending a lot more of our energy checking in with students on how they're coping with pandemic stresses. And none of that we begrudge our students. We choose to be professors because we want to work with the students. That's what we do. 
but it's a lot more energy and it's a lot more time. On the other side of the coin, faculty are kind of angry about the lack of investment in educational, instructional, and support services with faculty and staff salaries not keeping pace with cost of living, with other not keeping pace with other universities, and with positions around campus in terms of faculty and staff not always being refilled following some retirements. Um, there's sort of a lack of confidence in where we're going, um, especially in the last two weeks. What direction are we going? And where is what is the board's vision and mission for the long-term academic mission and direction of the university? The net result, kind of with the push-pull factors um, on all that, is faculty have a lot less enthusiasm for serving on committees about long-term planning, and they're choosing not to take on extra engagements to think about long-term planning, but rather focus on the current students that appreciate our time and energy. And that's likely gonna impact Senate and academic affairs, but also other strategic committees at the department committee and or college and university levels. <coughs> Um, in terms of why I'm bringing it up within Senate, this could very well mean that we'll have a less productive year this year than some years in the past. And though, quite honestly, that might make my life a little simpler, less reports to file and so on, I do hope that that ends up changing just for the growth and the betterment of the academic mission of the university. In any case, um, that's the end of my report. Um, Senate meetings will continue bi-weekly throughout the year. Uh, as I did last year, and as the previous Senate chair did, I'd invite a standing invitation to come and join us for one of our meetings. And I welcome comments and questions about the Senate and our work <coughs> at this point or any time throughout the year. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments? And I, I do want to note that. Uh, Committee member Trustee Fatanti has also joined us <clears throat> virtually. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Alexis. Hello. Thank you very much for the, the yeah. excellent report. Thank you. Any questions? Or? No, I, I look forward to hearing from you again. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Okay. Next on the agenda is the charter schools update. Uh, Dr. Holt, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Does that come with the mask? Or? Exactly, it's, it's part of the mask. <laughs> yes, yes. So good morning, Casey Holder, Charter Schools Office. Uh, thank you for the time. Just gonna update you on five things that are in the, my focus and the work that I'm doing. So in the agenda that was forwarded, or in the memo forwarded, uh, start of the year, the good and the bad. The good is all nine schools up and running. Uh, the bad, two of them are already shut down, are virtual due to the pandemic. They have cases, 18 cases in JKL, balloting over in the Sioux. Shut it down, they're doing a sanitation type thing. So it's flexible. We're kind of going with the flow. Uh, the only requirement was that they did need to set uh, they, need, they did need to put their goal, their academic goal on their transparency page. All nine of them have done that. So that's the only state mandate so far. Uh, accreditation and assurances. Just wanted to let you know that as of last year, five higher ed authorizers were not, uh, 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 charter school authorizers were not accredited. Two of my peers went ahead down that road. So right now, there are only three <laughs> authorizers. So, oh, um, Eastern, Bay Mills, and Northern that have not chosen to go down the accreditation route. And so I wanted to share real quickly just a, a sentence, just one sentence. This is out of the MCL 380502. An authorizing body shall not issue a contract to organize and operate a new public school academy to be located in a community district unless they are accredited. So Basically, what the law is, is if we wanted to open a new school in Detroit, you would have to be accredited. So it has nothing to do with our existing school, George Crockett, that's in Detroit, only if we want to open a new one. And so basically, I would kind of put out as an informational item, just so you're aware, we're not accredited. The uh, reasons why I would say we don't need to pursue it are we do currently have uh, MDE, the Department of Ed, does site visits every five years to our office. 
So that's an external review. We also get peer reviewed by our council peers every five years. So we have two external reviews already. The cost of accreditation is about $1,200 annually at about $3,500 to $5,000 to host a visit. Unless you want to open new schools in Detroit, I don't see a need to actually go for accreditation. If there's any questions on that, I would be happy to add more data, but I have other reasons why I would say I wouldn't support that. Dr. Holder, and just when you talked about the five-year reviews, you have two of them. Correct. Uh, are they staggered? Yes. So uh, about a year ago, we did the peer review assurances, and we're up for the MDE in the next year-ish. Uh, year, I said year-ish because of the pandemic's kind of slightly changed that schedule. Thank you. So Casey, I mean, to summarize, we're working on a grandfathered, you know, type of yes. concept here. Um, the, the charter school we have in Detroit, how long has that been a school for us? 14, since 2014. Okay. Uh, and again, this is just in the city of Detroit? Correct. Well, in a community district, which otherwise is the, city, the Detroit proper. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item number three is we do have a renewal of South Point Scholars. That's the school down by Ypsilanti coming up this year. And that's just like last year. So in May, you'll be getting a recommendation on that one. I put that one purposely because they, the, the next hot topic item is, you may have heard for-profit charter schools. And there's a lot in the news about that right now. Um, there is no such thing in Michigan as a for-profit charter school. There is for-profit management companies of charter schools. And so I wanted to clarify that distinction. You may have heard that NHA, National Heritage Academies, is attempting to sell their buildings. So NHA has about 100 schools nationwide. 46 are located in Michigan. Grand Valley authorizes 22 of them. Central and Bay Mills are over 10. We authorize three, so Burton and Flint, Walton and Pontiac, and South Point and Ipsy. So we already have our attorneys, Dykema is who my office is represented by, as well as the PSA attorneys working with uh, reviewing the potential sell of these buildings, these 46 buildings. So my attorneys write up, I have one sentence to read that I think should be reassuring. The current draft of the form lease agreements shared by NHA, which is part of a larger finance transaction with campus partners, is not consistent with Michigan law. So our attorneys are taking the position that what NHA is attempting to do is against Michigan law. One example that's very requiring a 30-year lease. So as you can imagine, historically, our contracts have been about five years, anywhere two to five years. We have never had a lease agreement that goes beyond the term of the contract. The only exception to that is as if the PSA is literally buying the building, think a 30-year mortgage, but this is not the case. They are selling, the NHA is attempting to sell to a corporation that would then continue to lease. So they have lots of things they're working out. That's another item that I'll keep you apprised of. And, and you know, in December, we'll probably have some new updates on that. But are there any questions on that particular for-profit or NHA at this time that I can answer? I think you've explained it very well. Okay. <laughs> Lastly is just the update on uh, board. So we have new board members, we have reappointments, and I included this time just all of those so that you would have a complete list of all of our current standing board members and their actual, their standing, you know, if they're a community member or an educator and their terms. And so I know you have a busy schedule. I'd be happy to entertain any questions, but that's all for me. Thanks, Casey. Quick question, terms are for three years. So is that standard? Uh, pardon me, what? Three you... year, three year terms? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So those are the terms on the board members is a three year. And when there's a resignation? Except for if there's a resignation, then we would fill that. So if somebody had already served a year, we would be looking two to years. fill for two. So that they're always staggered. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And they don't have term limits, do they? No. Currently, that is, there's no term limit. And we have, we have some 
I don't want to state the actual, but we have one person that I'm pretty sure has been a founding, like 20 year term member on a board, mm -hmm. which is a good, as long as there's some new perspectives and ideas coming in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there has been. I appreciate your attention to this very mm -hmm. much. Yep. Very good, thank you. All right, well, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, we're going to receive a presentation from the Deaf Studies Program. Hello, oh, my name is Nesby Williams, and um, I just want to clarify why I'm wearing face shield. Um, it's a community view of like a facial expression. Mm -hmm. So that's why I depend on this year. So I swear to let you know. Okay. Okay. So I was done with program. Okay. So we have two different sessions. We have the stuff that is shipped to care. We have stuff that is minor. Okay. So we have um, credit credits for the ship to care. And then we have a credit that required. And then this we have a um a deaf one, a deaf two, deaf culture and deaf history. And then um we have minimum of twelve credits that you can shoot. We actually have forty courses that you could take from. And then our minor um credit credits for a minor. And then um we have a credit twelve required to take. Which is four questions as well. So eight to one, eight to two, step history, step culture. And then um you could choose the minimum of 12 credits of the lift. Um we arrange to one to four credits per classes. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna give you some facts about our sign language. Okay, so um Obviously, sign language is not universal because we have so many dialects from all over the world. Yeah. So, and then um, I have a very complicated sign because we have our own grammar, our own set X that we learn from. And then we have about 100,000 to 2 million people are estimated learning this sign or be familiar side. And then ADL is fourth most used language here in the US. <laughs> All right, so how you can be self aware? Okay, so how you get the person the person's attention? Uh, make sure you wave or tap the shoulder. Okay, um, it's very important to get the person to touch it before you start speaking. Mm -hmm. Because if you start speaking, we have no clue mm -hmm. if you're talking to me or if you're talking to another person. Okay. Um, eye contact. It's very important to do eye contact because of how we get your attention that you actually talk to me. Mm -hmm. So and mostly we need to use eye contact for the reading. Because I depend on the reading. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most of people don't use the reading. Sometimes they depend on sign language. Okay. So show the word good lady. Um, if you show, we feel that if you're 20. Okay. So if you talk normally, that would be great, you know, that we have a, a great competition with together. And Good lighting is very important because we need to see the size. If you don't have a good lighting, we have uh, a communication barrier. So, and then be clear and don't keep repeating. So it's very important to be clear. Sometimes I have a hard time understanding because um the asset. So if you speak clearly, that would be great. That we have a great competition with. And um, don't keep repeating because sometimes if you keep repeating, we feel that you get frustrated with us. Mm -hmm. So that's why we feel that, okay, if you 
I tend to repeat what you guys said. And if I'm right, right, if I'm wrong, you can repeat how about you then, okay? Okay, acceptable term. Okay, um, we don't like to use the word to impairment because it feels to assault to our community. So we have two different terms that we accept if that or hurting. So that is usually mostly to be acceptable than in the deaf world, I hearing world, are you hearing? It's up to you if you be accepted that term. Okay, so are you ready to learn some signs? Okay, so this is our alpha box. Okay, so I don't know how you start this movie. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably do our own video. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Yeah. You want to do first? Can we pause it? Can we pause? So, I don't know if you want to adjust the camera so the head's in the way. Uh, <laughs> I stand when I talk and teach. So, okay. So, I don't want to scare you, but I'm going to teach you something that's very rude according to the hearing world. Okay? Point, 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 point. It's really important in the deaf world that we point. Okay? So, right now, and I'm going to count to 10. You're going to find somebody with your eyes. You're going to look and you're going to be partner. And you're going to point at them. And I'm going to count. And you got to look at them. You got to look at them in their face, in their eyes. That's all you can see is your eyes, right? So that's where you got to look. So find a partner right now. Find a partner. Find a partner. Find a partner. Find a partner. Okay. Point. 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 Okay, mm -hmm. so when you point, point, I'll point. And, then, and and we have as as instructors yourself, when you're scanning and all the students, they're sitting there and you kind of just touch on their eyes a little bit, make sure you're checking, you're checking in, make sure they're attentive. Just stop, try it. You just stop in the middle of your presentation when you're teaching. You just stop and you look at someone. And then they're like, <gasps> okay, and then you go on. Your students will pay attention. <laughs> think, I might be next. Okay. So pointing, it's really important. Yeah, we were taught it's really growing up, but it's a part of our world. Yeah. Yeah, that's community for the okay if we point. Point. You know, mm -hmm. even though I was born raised in a family, so of course my parents would say it's not nice to point. And that's part of how we communicate. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want something or if you talk about that birthday, you know, mm -hmm. so that our natural thing, you know, in our the world is to point something. Like for example, your your pants. Those are cool. Can I get him to stand up? Everybody look at those pants. Look at them pants. <laughs> I like those. So I'm in a point. And you're like, I'm so embarrassed. So happy I got this <laughs> Right? And that's another thing. Autism. Do you know what autism is? There's a couple of different definitions. Mine is anything that gets in the way, a barrier, for open communication for the deaf, hard of hearing. So everybody's walking around with your masks on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My own insides, I can't communicate with you clearly. I need to see some facial expressions. 
If you're mad, <coughs> I want to see it so I know. If you're happy, oh, I want to join you. I want to see them smile. So autism, anything that's the barrier to communicating, okay, with the death of the human, okay? And one more thing. You were saying about good lighting, right? So good lighting, you know who invented the lights, right? Well, actually, there's a filament inside, right? Okay, Thomas Edison, right? Do you know why he was so enthusiastic? He was so gung ho about inventing and making sure we got lights. Do you know why? He was deaf. You can't lip read in the dark. Your turn. I mean, say this. There we go. Okay, so we have A. We have B. We have D. Make sure it is. Mm. Yeah, there we go. The E. F. G. K. L. M. The Q. Yes. Oh. The P. The K. Switch it down. Mm -hmm. The Q. <laughs> All right. Okay, so then that we're going to be in the for numbers. We're going to do the numbers. Okay. I'm going to change the next time. Okay. <laughs> There we go. Okay. We have two numbers. Yeah. Okay. So we have one to 30. And we have one. Okay. So we'll make sure we have the number of basic. Okay. So one. Okay. And then two. And then three. We put the thumb off. That's the three. Okay. The four. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. We're going to get that hard part. Sixteen. So sixteen. Ten plus six. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Ready, seven. Ready, eight. Ready, nine. Ready. Now shake it off. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know. I can see other prayer if you do and yeah. So yeah. Okay. So now we have learned how to giant. Okay. So if you want to say, you know, what's your name? Okay. So you are name what? Okay, and then you will pick a spot your name. Okay, so if you want to practice how to spell your name, yeah, so that's me. 
okay, if you find that big, it's about your day. Okay. And then if someone asks, you know, Monday, big stuff. Okay, so it's very important to make a spell your name so we know who you are. Okay, because the time we have a conversation a lot of time and we want to know what's your name. So we'll be familiar with who you are the next time. Okay, and then it's just nice to meet you. So nice to meet you. So nice to meet you. Okay. Okay, so your name was my name. I think you figured about your name. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then nice to meet you. All right. Okay, so we learned about science to a very basic science that you be familiar. Okay, so we are please, please. The we have sorry, the S, sorry, sorry. And then we have hello, hello. And then we have yes, and then we have no. Okay, the point is to shake your hand. Mm -hmm. No. All right, then yes, you shake the yes. All right. So, why don't we just go ahead and say yes? Why don't we just go ahead and say no? Because yes and no are body language. ASL, ASL, then we match it with our expressions and what our intent is. Have a cookie, mom, please. Go. <laughs> okay. Go. Okay. So, ASL. ASL, body language. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having us. It was nice, nice to meet you all. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Should I ask you all for questions or? Does anyone have any questions that does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? To what extent does early childhood education impact who comes to your classes? Yes. Yeah, um, we have some few students who are in early education and I always let my students know it's very important to learn sign for birth. I have two daughters. They're both here and they know more than through their eyes. And my daughter are two and one. And it's very important because, you know, of course, little kids, they pick it up really fast. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice to express their feeling early. It just be um, not angry, but frustrated that the parents will understand. But if they sign, to the parent, the parents will understand where they are. So I definitely encourage you all students with major minors to take ASL, but it's very important to be familiar because you have to go to a career and you have a tough child or a tough person becoming to your work. And the time is hard to find an interpreter because it's not a lot of interpreters. So that's why it's very important to know my like, face design. If you know face design, the that person will actually feel more comfortable. So, and not be frustrated. Mm -hmm. okay. And also with your question as well, early um, education with children, my oldest son is autistic. So he started out, his first language is signing, okay? So he would be frustrated. My third son ended up with uh, apraxia. He couldn't speak either for three, four years. Um, again, we sign, we sign. So our children weren't frustrated communicating with mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. Very important. Thank you. Any questions? 
you mentioned you mentioned the barrier yes with the masks and COVID. Yes. so so my first instinct is to take it down so you can see my, my lips is that okay yes okay yeah yeah it's very important especially with cold day and it's very big impact to our deaf community and it's very hard mm -hmm. for us to actually communicate because it's so relaxed and the reading or signs so mm -hmm. it's very frustrating you know and some kind i feel that people are getting frustrated with me because i'm not understanding because of the math you know mm -hmm. so i'm a core i'm a cochlear implant user mm -hmm. and sometimes it's hard to understand behind the math because you can hear the math moving around and you're not catching any proper sounds from where you're trying to speak so so and then i'd like to add to that with what our colleague said here earlier about working double so mm -hmm. you guys get to hear everything each other we screen behind your mask. We need to see those faces, the look brief. So the students, you know, trying to make that connection, facial expressions, body language. I would say we're working triple time trying to communicate with our students because of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even these, they get all glary and students can't see our facial expressions and stuff. And they <coughs> ask us, could you please repeat? Could you show that again, please? With these you get all glary so yeah mm -hmm. it's very frustrating with any other questions any other questions thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you nice to meet you all so what a great opportunity. This is something that we've typically been able to do kind of pre-COVID. We would have um, one of our departments come in. So that was great. Thank you. Okay. Um, next on our agenda, uh, we have Dr. Paul Mann. Um, we're going to talk about the Master of Science in Speech Language Pathology. Feels joined? Yeah. So thank you for the opportunity to brief you on um, where we're at with the speech language pathology master's program here at Northern. So what does a speech language pathologist do? They treat a variety of speech language and fluency disorders in people ranging from children to adults, and that can occur as a, as a result of a social issue, it can be due to a mental issue, medical issue, um, trauma, stroke, concussion, that kind of thing. So they do a whole lot of different things as well as things like swallowing and feeding disorders. And so, and that occurs in a variety of different locations, schools, hospitals, rehab centers, long-term care facilities. In the last couple of months, I've seen two different um, commercials that were advertising for a speech language pathology um, professional in one of the long-term care facilities that they're building here in the UP. So there's definitely a need. And the Labor Bureau of Labor and Statistics estimates that there's a nearly a 30% growth over the next 10 years. That equates to 45,000 jobs and the average salary is somewhere around $84,000. So there's a need nationwide for this profession. In order to work in the profession as an SLP, you have to have a master's degree right, at a minimum along with certificate from ASHA and state licensure. So Northern used to have a master's program in speech language pathology and from the 60s through the 90s and late 90s, early 2000s, it was um, shuttered. And it was shuttered for a variety of different reasons. And then it was 2015, 2016, where the former president um, put out a five-year vision and in that five-year vision, it included that we would have a speech language pathology master's program. And that occurred as a result of multiple people in the community um, reaching out to him, asking him why we can't do that. And so I started working with our um, faculty to get that process started. In the academic year 2017-18, we brought in a consultant 
and had that person look at what do we need? What resources do we currently have? What resources do, will we need? You know, what faculty needs, staffing needs, that kind of thing. Put together a great report. We started executing that. Um, we put the GPC report together, got that put through and approved by Senate and the Board of Trustees in 2019 and started the actual process of trying to get the program started after that. Um, we got our accreditation package off to ASHA in January of 2020. Um, and that was with a planned 2021 fall start. And that's because it takes 18 months from the time that you submit the packet before you're allowed to have your first student on board. And then at that point, you can be granted candidacy. And then a year after candidacy, you'll have a site visit to go through the formal accreditation process. So update, what happened, right? So one of the things we did was we were able to hire a clinical director in the fall of 2019. That's a staff position. We did that intentionally because we wanted to establish all of the community relationships, get the clinic up and functioning um, in order to be able to bring the first set of students in and have that already operating because that first year would be on campus and then the second year for the students would be in clinical affiliates. Um, so we wanted to get that going. We did that and she's done an absolutely fantastic job. And I'll talk about some of the opportunities that we've realized as a, as a, a fact of bringing her in. Um, and then we were anticipating three different um, faculty positions, a 12 month full-time position that would be the program director and then two supporting um, nine month positions. At least one of those would have to be a PhD. We had an active search and we had three candidates that were qualified on that search. We offered a position to the first person um, and that was just as the pandemic had kicked in in March of 2020. And that individual declined the position because he elected to stay at his current location and take a postdoc position because of some concern about moving in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we reached out to the other two candidates and they had both already accepted other positions. So at that point, we had a failed faculty search. Um, and so then, you know, between myself, Dale, um, Carrie and others, we elected to put the program on pause and reflect on when we could restart it once we had a better idea of what the um, both university's financials were and what we were gonna be able to do as far as hiring positions. So we did that, and then it was in January of 2021 where I reached out to administration saying, can we restart this process? Um, and we did that because in order to get the program going, we have to resubmit that accreditation packet back to ASHA. And there's only two times we can do that, July or January. And so with that 18 month process, if we had gotten that decision in January, we could have resubmitted immediately we could have done a fall of 2022 start. Um, and, and we just haven't come together as a group to make a final decision on when and if we're going to restart the program. Um, that's unfortunate. Some of the things that we've recognized as a result of bringing in Diane, who's our clinic director, um, we've got 20 plus clinic clients that are um, being treated in the clinic right now. She's maxed out and that's using undergrad students who are seniors to help with therapy. We have a waiting list. The reason she's not here this morning, she has a brand new client at nine o'clock today. Um, as a result of the COVID pandemic, we were forced really to implement um, remote therapy. Well, that's a blessing, right? Because we live in a rural area. So being able to deliver therapy remotely to clients via a secure network is a great opportunity for this program that we can leverage to bring in students um, that are interested in doing that. And it just so happens that there's a group in Beaumont, Texas that are interested in doing that same thing here. So they've established a program there that does that same thing in rural Texas. They have ties to this university. They're interested in doing the same thing here. Um, it, as a result of that, there's been um, Therapy delivered to Belize as a result of Diane going to Belize for a summer project. There's been a Parkinson's treatment group started. Um, she's working on a gender affirmation voice program. 
We're looking into buying what's called a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing scope, which allows us to go out to long-term care facilities and do swallow studies on the residents so they don't have to leave in the middle of a pandemic to go to a hospital and expose themselves. Um, and so many of these opportunities are, are being leveraged now and there's many more. We could easily work with the concussion group here. Um, our um, adjunct faculty that teaches our audiology course has told me we have the best hearing booth on in the region. We have an opportunity if we're able to bring in an audiology faculty member as part of this program to develop a regional hearing conservation program. There's lots of opportunities. Um, and, and I personally would like to see this program move forward. And so that's where I'm at. The thing I would just add, um, <clears throat> as Paul mentioned, you know, we did hit the pause button because of COVID. There was a lot of uncertainty with the budget and there's a lot of uncertainty with enrollment. Um, this, this program, uh, as, as Paul mentioned, is, is super, super important. And it's great that we have the facilities here to do it. Um, the undergraduate students that are in the in the program, they have to get a master's degree in order to be able to work in this field. So they um, they they move on. They graduate from us, and and we we lose them. And we'd like to capture those. And so we have we have those undergraduate students that are here already. Plus, we know that this program, if we start it, will attract more because they'll say, "Well, I can just complete my education." At Northern, I don't have to. I don't have to leave. Um, Paul mentioned some of the things. You know, things have changed. Things have changed with, with COVID and and, and you know the freshman class. You know, at least for now, it's 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 um, uh, enrollment is up. Um, and you know, we have been working with uh, Elise Burr over at Center for, for Rural Health. Um, she's been instrumental in helping with the with the scope and the acquisition of the scope. Um, so we've identified some further revenue streams. Um, and that we that we can utilize. So um, yeah, we're hoping, you know, both Paul and I share that sentiment. We're hoping to get this program launched um, and put a lot of work into it already. And and uh, we have some folks that are interested in, in coming up here and helping us get it started. So. Dale, Paul, uh, what type of numbers are you talking about? You're saying enrollment's up. What what are the numbers that we're talking about? Well, I'm saying about the freshman class in the university overall. And so the demographics look a little bit better. But we're um, we currently have 50. I'd have to look at the spreadsheet. Tell me in the current program, we were up to 80 at one point. Yeah, that would be I think the last numbers I got were about 80 yeah. that Carrie had signed me. So historically, we're around 80. We're down to mid 40s, and that's. Honestly, that's a function of not having a master's program here mm -hmm. and students recognizing that they're going to have to leave. And I firmly believe that if we had an opportunity for those students to stay, more of them would elect to come. So we're talking about a potential of more students coming in because the master program is there. And then those that are here, we'll stay. we're talking yeah. about 80. Uh, on, on stay, average, so we, we, we're looking at probably a threshold of literally 80 to 100 or so, do you think? That's, it, in 2014, we had 80 plus students in the major. And that was actually down from the 2011, 2012 timeframe. And, and so it's it's just managed to trickle down over time. And that's a function of right. other graduate programs elsewhere in the state and the region right. have implemented an undergraduate program to their university as a feeder. Yep, We're the exact opposite. We're now a feeder to other graduate right. programs. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to me, this this <laughs> seems like a very, very simple direction that we need, need to move forward into in, in doing this. Looking at the numbers, Greg and Carrie had sent them over, I think, uh, five, so far, starting five years ago, it was 84. Um, students 68, 60, 55, and now we're down to 49. Mm -hmm. And as they're mentioning, it's it's a lot of that is directly affected by the fact that we don't, it's kind of a moot degree, if I understand correctly, when you're getting a bachelor's and then you don't have an avenue for a master's program. I guess, I, and, and this, I, I don't know who this is a question for, but I guess what I'm a little concerned about is we did approve this program. We did say to move forward with it. I understand that there were, you know, situations and, and things that need to be considered with COVID, right. but, you know, it, at least myself, and I'm not aware that any of the other board members were made aware that we paused this program. I wasn't made aware that we paused the program, but, but what I wondered too, is I know when we 
approved it, there was community need was one of the elements that really was a, a strong moving force for us wanting to approve it. Has that changed? No, it's actually increased with COVID. That one of the things that can happen with long-term COVID patients is they need additional therapy. And so now the great now the need is even greater. And, and and what we've realized as a result of not being able to do some face-to-face -face therapy is that there are people we can reach remotely that we wouldn't have reached before. So the people that you know wouldn't want to drive three hours to come to campus to get treatment that can't get it in their community, we might be able to bring them onto campus one time, or maybe we can go to them once, establish that relationship and then deliver the therapy remotely. Uh, that's just something that's been a realization of one, having the clinic director and two, having a pandemic. It, it's turned out to be an opportunity that we would not have expected. Yeah, and, and just to summarize what I believe I heard is with this endoscopy, you know, the endoscopy swallowing scope, there is an opportunity to generate some revenue too to offset some of these but costs. Between the scope and being able, if we can establish a billing program for services beyond just the scope, we're estimating somewhere around 35,000 a semester. And because it's a three semester program, we're looking at maybe 100,000. So there's nothing to vote on or approve right. here. It's been approved. I, okay. think, that, what I, was ask I, I think that this, the direction is that we just need to move forward with this. Tammy? Yeah, I just was saying that, that the committee members are allowed to speak because it's a committee oh. meeting. Sorry. Are you shushing Donna? I was. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, Tammy, I, I mean, any thoughts from, from your end? I no, mean, it's a no brainer. As we, far as I can. we have already approved it. Exactly. Yeah, we've so. already approved it. So there's really no action. Okay. I mean, so. Is is there is there a barrier here or an obstacle that no, we feel that we need to additionally remove? Because I think that we all agree that this is you know very easy. As a matter of fact, I think the barrier uh, from our end was uh, finding a qualified faculty, as Paul mentioned. We had the okay. search, and then, but I think now we're in a climate where we can move forward, you know, successfully. I, I think we just need to start a new search. Start a yeah. new search. Okay. Yes. All right. Very good. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the update. Okay. Um, last, certainly not not least, um, on the agenda is the new program approvals. Um, and Dr. Carrie Schuling, Provost and VP for Academic Affairs, I think is going to do this presentation. Just so you're aware, this will require uh, a, a recommendation to the full board. Is Lisa on or not? Is she she has been connected, but she's not showing the video currently. Okay, but she is on. I'll check again. She's it's it's just important for us to understand. Yeah, me, for... me she's on there. Okay. <laughs> um, is, yeah, we have um, the first up is a certificate program plant based wellness and cannabis, and Kim Kalasa is supposed to be presenting. Lisa is not connected right now. There she is. Okay, thank you. See you can do whatever you feel comfortable doing. Please feel free to. I'm going to adjust whatever so makes you feel comfortable. As, you know. Good morning. Thank you for um, representing the university and providing the leadership certainly that we need during these challenging times. So I am, um, I guess I advance the slides, right? I'm Kim Kalasa. I'm an assistant professor in the indoor agriculture program and also the program coordinator for indoor agriculture as well as these newly uh, proposed certificates around plant-based wellness <coughs> and cannabis operations. And I would like to acknowledge that while I'm representing the faculty, uh, this certificate creation process was very much a team effort um, led by Dr. Steve Vanenavond, Dr. John Sentko, the department head, Stephanie Zadroga-Langloy, who's the director of workforce development, 
as well as Michelle Kimball, who is the finance manager for the College of Technology and Occupational Sciences. <clears throat> this slide provides program or certificate descriptions. And <clears throat> the key things that I want to point out is that the cannabis operations certificate is really delving into the frontline aspects of, and the workforce needs for the cannabis retail industry. And the idea is that students would learn advanced dispensary retail operations. They would learn how to interact and, with and lawfully instruct customers about cannabis. And they would also develop the strong foundational knowledge for the cannabis business environment, including the regulatory components and the day-to-day -day sales operations, as well as the processes for establishing compliant protocols and practices for remaining compliant. In, in contrast, the plant-based wellness certificate is dealing with the retail and frontline services and the competencies needed to interact with and lawfully instruct others about broader plant-based wellness. This relates to how plants and plant-based products can impact systems in the human body. And it also in the curriculum will delve into the historical elements of integrating plants into wellness and provide students the foundational knowledge needed to pursue careers in plant-based wellness along with regulatory compliance and establish the practices for remaining compliant. These are some overview um, facts around both of the programs or both of certificates. So in both cases, they offer a natural augmentation of the indoor agriculture program, which of which I'm the program coordinator. They will provide an enhancement to NMU's growing niche around plant studies, including not only indoor agriculture, but we have a, a strong botany program now. We have the medicinal um, plants chemistry program, and we also have the non-credit based um, cannabis certification online. So we are also connecting this to the applied workplace leadership program, and that's based on interactions with industry representatives who have said they're looking for industry leaders. And so that became a natural connection that we were able to make through global campus. Additionally, this offers students laddering possibilities, these certificates, into, for instance, the associates in indoor agriculture or other baccalaureate programs at the university. Both are rapidly expanding industries. So from the market research future cited in 2019, the plant-based wellness industry is expected to surpass 129 billion in revenue by the year 2023. And the legal cannabis for both medical and recreational use is expected to surge 35 billion by 2025, according to the 2020 Global Newswire. Projected enrollment for the first year for plant-based wellness is 15 students, and then increasing in year two to 25, and further to 50 students by year five. For cannabis operations, projected enrollment for year one is 20 students, increasing in year two to 40, and by year five to 80. This table outlines the coursework for the cannabis operations certificate. In both cases, each certificate is 16 credits, and the technical concentration includes a four credit either the plant-based wellness 101 course or the ethical leadership and workplace through the global campus. A second four credit course is the cannabis fundamentals. And then four two credit courses delving deeper into cannabis use and effects, dispensary operations, federal dispensary regulations and state dispensary regulations. This is the proposed budget for the cannabis operations certificate, including salary. Well, it's the three-year cost of adjunct instruction. And so 
um, what is identified in the proposal is that these instructors would be industry-based instructors who have the depth of knowledge in order to teach these courses, as well as the academic credentials. And they would be hired as adjunct instructors, but also are being, um, will be encouraged to go through the online instruction program through Northern Michigan University so that they actually have the uh, pedagogical practice reinforcement that we are providing at the university, as well as the industry expertise. So you can see the salary um, each year with fringe, fringe benefits for the adjunct instructor, and then for program coordinator, three years, and also the technology components. And then in terms of the second category, our curriculum costs, and that includes both new curriculum development as well as the development of the course syllabi. So total anticipated cost is $75,877. And again, that's a three-year cost projection. These are the courses proposed for the plant-based wellness certificate. Again, a total of 16 credits. And within the technical concentration, either taking, again, the four credit Plant-Based Wellness 101 or the Ethical Leadership 200. And then in this case, three, four credit courses that include the Fundamentals of Natural Wellness, Wellness Plants Uses and Effects, and Plant Wellness Customer Service. This is the analogous budget for then the Plant-Based Wellness Certificate. Again, a proposed three-year budget and including the salary of the adjuncts, as well as program coordinator, curriculum development, and course syllabi, totaling in this case, $96,003. Before I close, let me go back, there we go. Um, one of the things that I've been engaged with as the program coordinator for indoor agriculture is talking with many students and the students are very excited about the opportunity for these certificates, even for on campus, because they fold naturally into their elective credits. And so um, within the indoor agriculture program, for instance, more than half of our students do have an interest in cannabis. Many are migrating from the medicinal plant chemistry program, and they're excited about the opportunity to pick up the cannabis operations certificate for their course electives and develop that expertise to meet their goals. So they're learning, growing uh, through the indoor ag program. And then that's, that would provide that enhancement to their career goals and direction. And in terms of the plant-based wellness, that then satisfies goals of other students who are not interested in cannabis, but are interested in the indoor ag program. We teach them how to grow food. And so then how does that contribute to health and wellness and looking at other plant-based wellness um, approaches for their career that may be non-cannabis focused. So both are important, both are meeting needs, not only of our on-campus students, but then have the potential to draw, you know, globally uh, because of the online um, offer. That's what I have. I'm happy to answer questions. I personally get very excited when I see programs like this because, you know, we've, we've kind of been on the cutting edge of this since the very beginning, and it's just a, an industry that's going to continue to grow. Um, I, I'm curious about these, the certificates. So, you know, jobs in these types of markets, is that kind of the standard of what they're accepting, right? Because we're still very new in the field. So are certificates typically required to work in these industries? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, that's a great question. So all of the development of this, these certificates as well as the indoor ag program have been based upon meeting with industry experts. So we have an advisory council. As a matter of fact, we have to be there at 1030 for our industry advisory council. And so, Absolutely. What we're hearing is that by offering these certificates, it's a it's a leg up for students, either if they have if they're um, pursuing the associates, for instance, 
or have long-term goals for a bachelor's, it's an enhancement because it gives them a specialization or they can simply pursue these certificates, say from a global campus perspective, and it provides them the way I, I have a visual because I owned a business for 13 years, right? And you would have a stack of resumes. And if that, that certificate is in that resume, that resume would come to the top, right? Mm -hmm. That's gonna be the first person who- It's a differentiator. It's a differentiator. It's gonna make people stand out who mm -hmm. are interested in the industry. And it shows, it demonstrates their level of commitment and also enables them to become leaders in the field, which is what the industry is asking for. They want leaders. And I, I may have missed this, but there would be opportunities both online and face-to-face? -face. Only online for these certificates. Only online for these certificates. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. And they're developed so that students could complete a certificate in a one-year time frame, which is really um, efficient. Mm -hmm. And so that is going to open up you know, the um, appeal for mm -hmm. people. Do we know how many other um, institutions are offering these types of certificates? Yes. So based upon our research, the only university offering the online cert certificate that's analogous would be St. Louis University for the cannabis. And um, I'm just drawing a blank on the plant-based wellness. It is, are you drawing a blank? <laughs> plant-based wellness. There's one. Florida. Okay. It's a university in Florida. So, um, and then Lake Superior State is doing some face-to-face -face that's a little bit more chemistry oriented and they're not, they're not like these streamlined certificate mm -hmm. because in terms of regionally. Because we're such a pioneer in this, I mean, are there opportunities to really look at how we market this in the right way to get out to folks? Because again, it, it, we're pioneers and there's, there's just not a lot, a lot out there right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true, very true. And so that's where having that strong partnership with Global Campus and really developing those marketing entities um, and yeah, getting word out through industry journals. Um, and you know, we've, we've been able to do that via not just our specific outreach, but specific interest that's come to us. So like even the Indoor Ag program, we get contacted regularly from people in the industry or uh, industry associated journals mm -hmm. who want to understand what we're doing and what we're offering because it is so cutting edge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any mm -hmm. questions or that for me? I have about a thousand more, but we don't have time. So <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'll have to take it off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Thank you very much for your you. time. I'll leave this here. Okay, next uh, is, I think it's Bill Bingnight is gonna come and talk to us about Bachelor of Fine Arts, acting, love the pants. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Bill, how are you? Good. Can do it here, I guess. Oh, that's the wrong way. Cool, hi. I'm wearing my Department of Theater and Dance hat today. Um, my name is Bill Dignite. For those of you that don't know me, it's nice to see everybody. Um, happy homecoming. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about the BFA in Acting um, new degree proposal. Um, this has come out of a necessity. Uh, we really try to listen to when we're recruiting students and um, we did recruit fully uh, uh, online last year at, at four major um, uh, festivals and events. And one of the biggest things, uh, uh, I track all the students we interact with. I've got lots of spreadsheets and tons of fun stuff. But one of the biggest things I was finding is I was losing students because we have a BA in acting which uh, would be the generalist uh, degree. Uh, they want a little bit of technical experience. They want a little bit of acting. They want to kind of figure it out. Um, a lot of students that get BAs eventually go specialize in grad school. Um, we have been noticing that uh, through our data and, and tracking that we were finding students not coming here and students that were really, really interested in our program and the opportunities and everything that we're doing. And so I dug into that and I actually started calling them <laughs> and be like, why didn't you come here and where did you end up? Um, 
in a very polite way, um, <laughs> and because uh, we had offered scholarships and they didn't accept them, uh, so I'm like, well, I'm trying to give you money and you're not, you're saying no, so there's a problem there. Um, and we found out that they wanted a specialized degree. Uh, we actually lost six students at the beginning that would have started it this year because they wanted BFA acting programs. Four of them ended up at Eastern Michigan University, and two of them ended up uh, one at Oakland and one at I think Central. Um, and that was just six students. And I'm like, okay, that's not good. These are, I mean, I'm collegial, -like, but it's a competition to me. Sorry. And I want to win um, <laughs> uh, and grow our program. So um, uh, that's where this came from. Uh, and so it is a specialized degree. We, I, I don't want to say it's rounding out where we're going to be in our programming uh, because uh, as we get here. Oh, so um or, sorry, I'm looking at my phone because I put my slides there. I can stop that. Um, so we're currently producing full season of shows. 100% of department classes are in person, and we are planning for our summer season. We are back to a 12-show season. If you didn't get your season tickets, you should still do that. That's my pitch. I want your money. Um, <laughs> uh, no, uh, it's really exciting. Uh, last night was actually our first show, our collab collective, um, in the Forest Harvest Theater in two years. We had an opening night party. Um, I got Steve to drop all of you and come see a show last night. There's a show tomorrow night if you're bored um, after the football game. Um, uh, any NMU student can still participate in our program, no matter their major or minor. Um, the arts need to be within every student's uh, life, and um, we want them to continue that. Uh, we need audience members, so they still need to participate. Um, uh, so if they find that love here, we can hopefully cultivate that into the future. And collaboration is key. Um, we do have auditions and interviews for specific degree programs. This BFA in acting would be an audition interview based. They still get to come in their first year um, uh, and, and get in. And when I say audition interview, it's really just talking to us because we bring in cohorts. So our musical theater BFA, um, we brought in a cohort of students and we really do want to have that connection to make sure that we're using our scholarship dollars effectively. Um, some students might start in the BA uh, theater degree and transfer into the BFA specialized, uh, specialized degree. Um, I, I've used this slide every time that I talk to you because we are truly creating consistency. It's one of the biggest things I think higher education needs within departments, within the vision that we have within our department uh, here at the university is consistency in the product that we're offering. Um, there needs to be trust within the industry. Um, when we talk to high school teachers, I talk to a lot of high school teachers working within the arts. Um, and when they recommend programs, it's about consistency in what you're delivering to their students. They care about them deeply. They've spent four years just like we're gonna spend four years with them. And um, we've really done a lot of research in connecting with them. So the consistency is gonna build that culture. And we're really starting to see that. Um, over the last four years, uh, since I got here, we started, we were in the low teens of majors and we're just over 50 majors right now. Um, and a lot of minors and great experience. And we did grow during the pandemic, which um, I take as a win as an arts program. Um, again, that gets to tradition and then a legacy where people are like, oh, you went to Northern Michigan University and got your BFA in acting. That is what I'm looking for. Um, and I, our team is looking for, I, I'm speaking on the, for our team. Um, uh, and so, uh, exciting additions. Uh, if you looked at this four years ago, there was one bachelor's of science in theater. Um, we were giving out a bachelor's of science in theater. Think about that. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 and we had a minor in, the, uh, in theater as well. Um, we currently have a BFA in musical theater performance, BFA theater technology and design, BA theater, BA dance. Uh, we have minors in theater and dance and associates of arts, theater performance, theater tech and design and dance. And our uh, quickly, just to say, our associate's degrees are really to help uh, engage students that are TIP eligible to find a way to get into an arts program. Uh, it takes a lot of support to get an arts degree um, because there are a lot of unknowns. Uh, and so we need to work to facilitate a zero barrier for people to live out their dreams. And that is truly our goal is to facilitate that. Yeah. Uh, acronym TIP eligible. Uh, a tuition incentive program. Okay, it's a state funding. Program. Yeah, it's a state funding. Um, so we were finding students that were coming in, and we they were getting different associates degrees, but wanting to get a theater major. And I was like, well, how do we build a stepping stone to allow those students to just get in the department and and get going? Um, so we're only adding one thing this time. Uh, is the goal here is the BFA in acting, and it does come out of a need um, to fulfill uh, what. 
um, the, the industry is asking from us um, and what the students are asking from us at these regional um, events. We're very excited to be going. All of them are actually happening in person as of right now. And so we're very excited to, to meet the students and engage with them. Um, theater programs are in the top 70th percentile of search programs amongst universities polled um, uh, and search engines reviewed by Gray Associates data. Um, the the theater degree is a collaborative art form. Uh, it truly um, allows students to work in a team. And we are not just training for them to work um, at the Shakespearean uh, Theater Festival. This degree program um, will allow them to work in 90 different fields um, and allow them to take their skill sets that they learn there and apply them into so many different industries. Um, actors end up working in trade shows, actors end up working in film and television. You, if you have Netflix, you're watching people that have BFA theater degrees, but there's so many other places in sales. I cannot tell you how many actors are like, I know how to take on a persona. I know how to uh, assimilate the content and work in sales. So these specialized skill sets that they'll get within the BFA um, uh, really is not just saying, hey, you're going to be a starving artist. Um, I hate that term, to be completely <laughs> honest, um, because there's so many uh, ways to participate. If you go to immersion experiences, if you've been to Disneyland, um, every one that you interact with, the person that's the host at the front desk, the person that's taking your luggage, they're all considered characters. They're paid actors. Um, so it's redefining what the industry views and redefining what success is. So um, uh, we really work with our students to make sure that they understand that you can be an actor and you can use your, your skill and your art form um, and still pay your mortgage uh, and, and uh, save for retirement. Um, so again, BFA acting, uh, it's the elite degree program within the performing arts education. You get a BFA in undergrad, um, it might lead to a graduate program, but it is more, I want to come in, I want to specialize, I know what I want to do, and I want to get into the industry and get out there and work. Um, it's a more focused field of study, specific training and professional preparedness. We really are working to make sure that our students are ready to take on um, take on the market and take on the field. And we have students working right now. We have students that graduated in the pandemic that worked this summer uh, in professional theater um, in states that were open and, and theaters that are open, um, both in the commercial television world, in theater performance, um, circus in Vegas, and the opportunities are coming back more and more. Um, again, here's just a giant list of all the different things. I cannot tell you how many acting students that have a BFA end up becoming lawyers. Uh, more and more it's happening. Um, we tell stories in our life, and that is truly what I'm dedicated to doing is helping people tell stories. Every one of you tells stories in your jobs all day. Um, and uh, a BFA in acting, you can take that specialized skill in telling a story and, um, and apply it to really any, any industry that, that's out there. Um, again, uh, we're growing the program. How are we going to fulfill this program? Well, we're doing it already, but um, recruiting events, uh, uh, International Thespian Festival, uh, Michigan Thesp Thespian Festival, Wisconsin, Illinois, local and regional events. Um, one of the goals here, and uh, we did get some support from uh, Dale and Provost's office, um, uh, is getting to the International Thespian Festival, Texas Thespians, and Florida Thespians. Um, uh, fun fact in Florida and Texas for every dollar they spend on athletics, they have to spend it on the arts. So they have huge high school programs because they love their football. So they get to have lots of arts. They don't have as many BFA programs um, as they have people applying for it. So um, we have a couple of friends in Colorado that I would say are at regional comprehensive universities similar to our sizes that are there and seeing great success because they're like, we'd love to get out of the heat and have an adventure in the mountains and do it. Well, we, we've got it. So um, we're really trying to see unique ways to get students and bring them here. Um, uh, international experiences, we're working on accreditation. Um, oh yeah, sorry, okay. Uh, I know I had five minutes, yeah, I know, sorry. Uh, I talked too much. Uh, what can I do for you? Questions, comments, demagoguery, anything? <laughs> well, you said uh, you lost six uh, uh, this year. So you go forward, what will you expect your numbers to be? The, the, um, real, goal would, the real goal would be to bring in um, in full swing, if we can do it this year, now actually having the program um, uh, is to bring in a cohort of 10 to 12 each year and get it to 40 unique students. It is a specialized skill. Um, uh, through COVID, we started making movies and radio plays and film. 
uh, and and uh, doing more plays. Um, and so we're trying to attract those new students. So the real goal would be to have 40 unique students that are coming to that program within five years. And there's no additional real cost inside your program to do that? We'll, we'll need one faculty member um, to teach that, uh, but there's no structural costs. We have theaters, we have all the, the things. I mean, if you want to give me money, I'm totally down for that. Uh, we have lots of things that we could buy, but yes, right now we, we can, uh, do one uh one one faculty is what we need so so the the business case for this though with this one faculty member will be offset fairly quickly based on yeah yes. two three four whatever yeah that, that, yep, that was in our moment. proposal yep we definitely currently right now we'll do one faculty and with growth if we see extreme growth we regionally have adjunct um ability to to get it there until we can prove that we would need a second faculty through our growth model so when you say 40 40 people um that would be 40 people in the program at mm -hmm. any given time moving forward. B BF BFA programs taking cohorts. So like our musical theater, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Truckee, who runs our musical theater BFA right now, they brought in um, nine freshmen in the BFA musical theater program. Okay. They're only gonna be in that program. So the goal is to bring in 10 that are just in the acting program and they come in cohorts. They, that's how it happens in the industry currently. Okay. And I was trying, I was trying to determine, and, and again, I don't want to get into too much detail, but we kept using the BA of theater and the BFA and acting a little bit interchangeably throughout this. And I, I'm sure that there is a, a distinctive. Yeah, difference. yeah, it's definitely distinct. Sorry if I was doing that. That's okay. Um, so the, the BA acting is a generalist degree um, and where someone comes in and they're like, I'm unsure of where I want to specialize. They would start in the BA and take a lot of courses throughout the technical and performance and kind of uh, a la carte create your own concentration. Okay, and how many students do we have right now for the BA of theater? Uh, the BA of theater, I want to say is six or seven. Okay. Um, our BFA theater technology and design and our BFA musical theater are our two largest programs because okay. students are seeking a specialized skill set. Okay, great. Thank cool. you very much. Sorry for going over. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time. <laughs> I was just reminded of the time too. Thank you, Tammy. Um, Thanks. last, certainly not least, um, we're going to hear about the Master of Science for Administration of Outdoor Recreation and Nature-Based Tourism. This could be seen as a, a plus or a minus if you want to. <laughs> you know, last, uh, uh, she's going to probably say we're on the clock. Yeah, we are on the clock. Yes, yeah, so I appreciate to... that. So um, I will keep my skill short uh, because I've, we've provided the information for you and I'm yep. eager to see what questions you guys have. I'm Scott Jordan, a coordinator of the bachelor's degree program, Outdoor Recreation Leadership and Management, which Northern has hosted since 1972. It's a very successful program. I'm also supported by Liz Warren and the Associate Dean of the School of Health and Human Performance. So um, the Administration of Outdoor Recreation uh, 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 and Nature-Based Tourism degree will allow us the chance to have deeper study in this very new economy. So outdoor recreation is seen as a $887 billion industry. They ran a, uh, United States ran a, a gross domestic product um, search on it for the first time in 2017 and found it to be the third largest industry in the United States. So people are spending money on outdoor recreation. So uh, this is the case of an industry producing thoughts to develop a higher learning uh, uh, degree. So the degree is kind of made for, uh, to develop a business plan for this rapidly growing economy. So we're looking at that. Um, my idea is to graduate students who will leave Northern Michigan universities being lead, leaders in this industry. Um, when we talk about uh, the curriculum for this, the curriculum is two track, not really two track, but it's designed as a leisure and master's degree, which will put people in the same footing as gaining a master's degree from any other school that teaches leisure. But it has a strong uh, 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 curriculum component talking about administration, leadership, and sustainability, uh, and particularly in when we look at outdoor recreation and nature-based tourism. When I talk about nature-based tourism, uh, a more common word would be an ecotourism, uh, but nature-based tourism is a more accurate terminology for this. 
uh, when we uh, the degree is also centered around kind of the Costa Rican ecotourism model, which focuses on sustainability and Costa Rica's develop. It's their number one economy. So um, uh, they they've developed a lot of leadership in this. Area. So we're, we're looking at the triple bottom line model, uh, looking at a balance between economic interests, plus or minus uh, sustainability of the natural environment and effects on local cultures where nature based tourism is taking place. Um, more details about this. Uh, this is going to be offered through the global campus. We wanted to actually, Dale had recommended that it be an online degree so that we can broaden our, uh, 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 our student base. We're looking at employing uh, or, or um, getting students who are employed in the field and who would like to expand their knowledge base as well as expand their, their job opportunities. So for example, if you're in the National Forest Service, um, continuing education is one of the things you have to do to move up in the, the uh, area field. So um, we feel that offering this as an online degree is, is going to be helpful. Um, um, and Scott, I apologize if I could interrupt for just oh, a please. second. And I, 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 this is my fault because I wasn't keeping good track of time and I know that we've got a short period of time. Did you have an opportunity to read through the presentation? I went through it, right. Good. Good. Well, do we have any questions for Scott? No, I think it's exciting. This, this looks like an exciting program. Yeah, as far as the economy goes, it's on the same level of uh, cannabis right now. Uh, only, only it's legal in all states. <laughs> Good. And I hate to cut you. Well, I thank you all Scott. for your time. So, so Thank you very much. And I know that this will uh, require a vote and a recommendation um, that will need to go to the full board. I'd like um, to make the motion that we go ahead and uh, approve the certificates for plant-based wellness cannabis operations, the Bachelor of Fine Arts in Acting, and the Science Master of Science for Administration of Outdoor Recreation and Nature-Based Tourism. Okay. Um, I, I guess I have to support. Yeah, <laughs> Lisa's not on. Any discussion? We're good? Okay. <laughs> All in favor? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you.